You are now tuned in to the Storm Tracker Podcast. All right, it's the Storm Tracker Podcast. Marcus Benjamin here with Frank Tucker representing the crib, South Florida. We're representing canescounty.com, part of the rivals.com network. I got my heat hat on today because, you know, my boys represented uh, in game one, you know, and, uh, you know, we're, we're taking the Bucks out in five and we're going back to the Eastern Conference finals and to play Boston. But, you know, we're going to talk Canes today. Uh, of course, we're going to talk a little spring game and the wave, the wave has started, Frank, as far as recruits are concerned here in the spring with now Chance Robinson and Dylan Day added to the 2024 class. So we'll talk a little about that, who we're expecting to commit next. Should be a very busy week for the Miami Hurricanes when it comes to recruiting. And then we'll talk a little OT7. Uh, Frank was out there at OT7 Orlando, where the hometown DEFCON uh brought home the trophy for south florida so first off spring game man i i thought it was a good spring game but you know if you if you leave a spring game and you feel negative then oof, something's really wrong with your football team <laughs> for the most part after spring games people are positive cheery you know it's all flowers and dandelions and that's pretty much how we're feeling uh, right now, especially with performances from Hurricane Bain with three sacks, pressure in the quarterback. Probably should have got more because I thought he was held on a couple of plays. And then TVD uh, looked great as well, looked efficient, ran the ball a little bit. Uh, that was nice to see. And then uh, Emery Williams uh, what was kind of a standout for me. And then also – Ray Ray Joseph, man, uh, this guy that's, you know, gets up on the jug machine at 5 a.m. is out there, was out there catching touchdown passes at the spring game for Miami. What stood out to you? The freshman, the freshman, just like you said, those were the guys that stood out. Emory Williams, four for four. He looked like he was able to read a defense uh, better than most freshman quarterbacks that really have no expectations coming in. Remember, he was a three-star passer that Miami took as the second guy in this in that 2023 yeah. class. So he, I, I loved what I saw from him. I think it's more of a conversation for that second quarterback spot on, on this depth chart than people like to believe. And I, I love what I saw from Ray Ray Joseph. Obviously, the speed on that 79-yard touchdown uh, was a standout moment in that spring game. But what I really love to see was – the jet sweep type plays that they're starting to utilize him on. I mean, we go back last year, we talk about it time and time again. Romello Brinson was never a guy that was a jet sweep type guy. And that's what Josh Gaddis was using him as. And finally, we have an offensive coordinator that knows what his personnel's strengths are. So it seems that we're going to be utilizing guys in positions that we know they can succeed. We're not trying to put a round peg in a square hole. And it looks like Ray Ray Joseph, at minimum, is going to be an explosive gadget player for this offense this season, which is something we haven't really had in a, in a little while. Yeah. Uh, you look back, it hasn't been vertical threats. Rashard Smith turned into a underneath possession guy. Restrepo, love him to death. But he'll get you those 25-yard plays like he did in the spring game a couple of times. But again, he's not your 50, 60, 70-yard touchdown walking around every play. So I, I think Ray Ray is an absolute – absolute necessity in this offense now for just the speed that he brings to the table. And then can you say enough good things about Ruben Bain? Three sacks. Ruben Bain, baby. Th three sacks just it completely dominated. Didn't matter if he was going against starting group, backups. It, it really didn't matter. We've seen that 
from him throughout spring. What we've heard during team and scrimmages is also the same thing. He, he's just been a dominant player, whether that's at the four eye spot or traditional defensive end. Uh, I think he's going to have a Greg Rousseau type freshman impact. Do you remember what Greg Rousseau did even coming off the bench? It was like eight, nine sacks in a row. Like it, it was, it was a, an incredible run. I think it's going to be like that for Ruben Bain in his first year in Miami. And a guy that nobody's really talking about, and it's kind of surprising, is Francis Malagoa. He looked good at that right tackle spot. Because he's an offensive lineman. That's why. Yeah, I know. I know. But it, with the lack of offensive line talent Miami has had over the years, right, we have a potential future first-round draft pick. I said it. Potential future first-round draft pick manning the right tackle spot from day one. And I think that he looked really good. I think he looked better than Jalen Rivers, to be honest, who I think struggled at that left tackle spot. So to see Francis really step up and and, and do well in that first college atmosphere, that college game for him was, uh, was a really good thing to see. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think the offense just overall was just impressive. I, I really like the Shannon Dawson offense. I like – the jet sweeps basically to start off the game with Restrepo that went for about 25 yards. We saw it again with Nathaniel Joseph. And um, I'm just really excited of uh, just with the creativity of the offense that we saw. And we know we saw basic offense uh, in a spring game. And when we, when we see this offense again in, in a real game setting, we're going to see a lot more creativity that we didn't see during the spring game. So that makes me really excited for this offense and for TVD as well, who looked really comfortable, looked really efficient. I mean, he locked in on some receivers on a couple of plays, uh, but I think he'll be able to work those kinks out uh, through fall camp and through the season. So that, that, that was kind of the big takeaway for me. Okay. So this offense can go and this offense is not going to look anemic this offense is not going to go through an entire game against virginia tech and not score a touchdown you know i i just feel like this offense is going to put points on the board and the other big takeaway for me is this this 23 class may turn out to be one of the best ever i mean you talked about francis malagoa and ruben bean and we're talking about nathaniel joseph and we have yet to see a couple of guys even step on campus. Collins Ashenpong, we haven't even seen him due to injury. So there is more from this class that we will potentially see with players like Damari Brown, with play players like Mark Fletcher, Chris Johnson Jr., uh, Malik Bryant, who wasn't uh, dressed uh, for the game. I think this this class is really kind of setting the tone for the future. And Cristobal is definitely, you know, putting his stamp or or his brand on, on, on this team and this program with this 23 class. And, you know, yeah, you, you mentioned Hurricane Bain. And I've said this before privately to other people, but um, – this is going to be a hot take, Frank. I hope you're ready for this one. <laughs> but uh, I think this guy can be as good as Aaron Donald. That's how good I think he can be, especially from a size perspective. They're about the same size. The, the, the variety of moves that Aaron Donald gives you is the variety of moves that Ruben Bain gives you. And he's just a freshman not even really a freshman. He's really still a senior in high school right now, to be honest. And once he goes through his freshman year and sophomore year, I think he's just only going to get better. He's just, he's being schooled by Jason Taylor, one of the best to ever do it. I mean, when I told a couple of people that they're like, what really? But I'm still standing on that, especially after those three sacks that we saw in the spring game. Yeah, listen, <laughs> yeah, I, you know I love Ruben, right? I mean, that's that's my guy. Um, you know, I, I, we've been covering him since he was, you know, a baby in high school, right? So yeah. we know we know Ruben pretty well, and I love him. That's a 
that's a crazy cop. It's a crazy cop. Like just because we're talking about potentially the greatest defensive lineman of all time, right? Yeah. But I, I don't think you're you're being blasphemous, right? I think obviously it's very early, but I do think that there are some similarities to him. Uh, maybe like Kalaja Kansi is another good comparison. Um, even though he plays more of a defensive tackle type role, he can have like a Will Anderson type career, maybe. You know, Will Anderson's not the biggest, not the fastest, not the strongest. It's part of the reason why he's not the number one, not really in the consideration for a number one pick, but just knows how to get to the quarterback. And that's really what Ruben Bain does really well is just get to the quarterback, do things right. Uh, he, he's with most freshman defensive linemen, you don't really see like counter moves. You don't really see that understanding of footwork, hand placement, things like that. They're just trying to just get to the quarterback. Ruben's got an understanding of pass rush and a lot of that goes into the work that he has routinely put in, whether that was with coach Jamal Sheffield at Miami central, uh, you know, before and after practice or with his brother, Reggie Bain, uh, currently at the university of Miami where you see them constantly working after practice together. He's an offensive line coach and he's teaching him what an offensive lineman would be doing to stop what his initial move was and, and kind of going through those counters. So I think that Ruben Bain, like I said, is going to have a huge freshman year. I think, you know, this kid has 80 sacks since he was a freshman in high school, 80 sacks, including that game last night. That is a ridiculous amount, especially with the fact that his sophomore year, he only played like six games. And he still had like 13 sacks that season. So it, the, the the production is there. The pedigree is there with Division One bloodline. We know he's a hard worker. We're never going to get lesser of Ruben Bain than, than we should because we know he's always going to be prepared. Um, listen, to get him in this, in this class was the equivalent of getting uh, Cam Kinchins and James Williams in 2020, I think. Two yeah. generational type talent type players, right, that were looking elsewhere. And then it ended up deciding to stay home late in the process. So I love that. Another guy that we haven't talked about in that freshman class that really looked good and stepped up due to injury was Riley Williams. You don't really see the freshman tight ends have those moments, especially in a spring game. An early enrollee freshman tight end had those moments in a spring game. And he looked good catching the football. I know it wasn't crazy explosive plays, but he was doing some nice things, running drag routes, getting open, catching the ball, contested catch opportunities too. Uh, he's a good player, man. He's a good player. He's going to have to add some size. We know he's going to have to hit the weight room this summer and, and really add some mass uh, to re- to help in that blocking scheme at, other than just being a big receiver. But I, I think that if Elijah Arroyo – does get nicked up again, which we've seen happen, or we see Julio Skinner, uh, you know, kind of get nicked up. He had a nice catch in that game. Uh, I think it was only like nine yards, right? But overall, like if he doesn't step up, Riley Skinner is a capable second tight end option yeah. on the team. I, I, I'm excited to see from him, you know, the future. I, I, I'm not expecting 400, 500 yards this year. Don't say this isn't Brevin Jordan 2.0 right now. But I think he's a guy that can be that next really good tight end at the University of Miami. He can have a better career than a Will Mallory. And I think that he could do what Elijah Royo is expected to do in this offense as soon as this season. Yeah, absolutely, man. Uh, I was really impressed with Riley Williams as well. Just based on, I mean, I, I try to temper my expectations with the Hurricanes, but I can't help myself, man. Like, I, I drink the Kool-Aid, like, every year, bro. Like, every year I drink the Kool-Aid. I'm just like, yeah, you know, maybe this team can make it to 9, 10 wins. And, you know, usually I'm disappointed when it when the season comes to fruition. But what gives me optimism is the class, you know, is this class. Just the fact that these rookies are out here balling already. And I wouldn't be surprised if Ruben Bain, Francis Malgoa, and Riley Williams end up being first round draft picks. I, I, I wouldn't be surprised. I know I'm coming with the hot takes today, bro. <laughs> but I'm just saying, like, I just wouldn't be surprised if those three, just kind of based on their skill set, and what they shown in 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 the spring game and you know the fact that they're excelling against players that have played college football for a little bit now 
the fact that we're seeing them excel just gives me a lot of optimism about this team going forward. But Frank, there is a flip side to everything. There's a yin, there's a yang, right? What are some of the negatives that you saw from this spring game that gives you pause, cause for concern, um, little hesitation, anything not so positive that you that you took away from the spring game? I think TVD looked good. I think he looked good, right? And, and this isn't me saying that he's TVD of last year. But we got to temper our expectations on what he's going to do this year because he's still holding on to the ball for long periods of time. There's a reason that Ruben Bain had three sacks and that there were other guys like Chance Williams who had two sacks, right? Like Ahmad Moten was getting a lot of pressure. There's a reason for that, and that's because TVD holds the ball really long, okay? And he still struggles to go through his reads at times. He's not an excellent quarterback from a – mental standpoint um, at, at certain points, man. And and I think that just natural talent, there aren't many better than him uh, throwing the football. But he he's still got to expand his game past being that guy can just throw it up to, to, you know, special players and letting them come down to come coming down with it, right? Like a Colby Young or getting it to Xavier Estrepo running across the field on a drag, right? Or, or finding a wide open Ray Ray Joseph. That's something that happens during the year, right? Like those are the things that it, it's fun to watch. It's a highlight tape opportunity, but it's the little things with TBD that I think there's still kinks, like you said, kinks to be worked out. Um, so I, I think that's, He's still in that Brad Kaya range for me. He's still in that Brad Ooh. Kaya range where we're hoping for eight to ten wins, which isn't terrible. It, but he has not, he has not gotten over that hump of that Heisman type quarterback, in my opinion. The Bryce Youngs, the C.J. Strouds, like those guys have an extra layer to their game outside of their athletic and arm, ta- athletic abilities and arm talent. And I think that TBD still got to bring some of that to the table, and, and I'm hoping that this summer he gets in that film room with Shannon Dawson and continues to work that out. Uh, another thing is the run game. Before, was- before you get to that, I want to counter that. Um, I think you should probably cut him a little bit of slack because. I, I, listen, I'm being, I'm being facetious. Listen, I, I'm, yeah. I'm just throwing out the devil's advocate, right? Like I'm not trying to kill him. I'm not trying to kill him, but I'm also being the guy that like we've seen this in the past, right? Where we've had some hope in the spring game, right? And it turns into a seven win season. Right. Yeah. So I, I just want to say, like, there were still some things that it wasn't perfect. It wasn't perfect. I, that's why yeah, I, I started it out by saying it was a really good performance by TVD. I think he looked good. I think he looked comfortable. I think he looked confident. They were throwing it downfield more often than they were last season, trusting him to be able to make those throws, those contested catch throws. Uh, like the, they were utilizing the fades in the red zone, which is something that I think TV just likes to do. I think he likes to utilize his guys, his guys on the outside. We saw, Jacoby, we saw Jacoby George make that really nice catch. Uh, we saw yeah. Kobe Young almost come down on one uh, on uh, on Devontae Brown on the left side of the, of the field. But uh, there, there were still some things that he needs to work out. So, you know, th- there were some interceptions opportunities that were missed, right? Like, yeah, I mean, I think that's the thing for me. I, I think that there was a couple of balls that could have been interceptions uh, for, for TVD. And I think TVD was being safe for the most part. But those moments where they were almost interceptions were those moments where he just locks in on one receiver and he looks, he looks, he looks, and then he throws and he throws late sometimes. So, you know, to your point, yeah, he, he's holding the ball a little bit too long. But I, I think – and then with the sacks, I think he was just playing it safe. I think he was like, okay, well, I don't see what I want. I didn't see my second read quick enough. So I'm just going to hold this for a sack. You know, this is a spring game, and I don't want to look bad out here in the spring game. And interceptions kill your confidence. Let's – let, let's be honest, and you don't want to leave a spring game with three picks or something like that. So I, I think he was playing it safe more so than not playing well. And he's and listen, I didn't. I'm not saying he didn't play well. And to his credit, he's only been in this offense for like two months. Right, that too. So that's part of it too, right? So there's still not a full understanding or scope of the offense, which I think is going to get better over time. 
But we've had TBD in the program for a little bit now. We know what he brings to the table. We know what his weaknesses are. We've seen him at his high points. We've seen it's him at a third little, system, at, though. It's third, third system. Third system. And and we've seen that crater guys like Ja'Cory Harris in the past, right, where we've seen highs, right, Heisman expectations to really lows. So I'm not saying he's Ja'Cory Harris. I'm just saying, right, that – there are yeah, some respect on Corey Harris's name, man. Hey, I'm not. I'm, again, no disrespect <laughs> here. I, hey, I'm Switzerland. All right, I'm just being devil's advocate, right? So, I, I just I think that there are definitely some things that need to improve for TBD and his ability to read the field and goes through his progressions a little bit better. The run game for me was a little worrisome. There wasn't really that many big plays. I think Don Chaney had that 38-yard touchdown run, but it was during tap, thud, whatever we were doing. So non-physical yeah. side of the defense wasn't in the first half. He looked explosive at times. He, yeah. There was another run where he, he kind of scampered out. They called it dead early. But I liked seeing him healthy. But still, it's really – there's we're missing that component of a – elite run game and I'm hoping that Mark Fletcher can bring that power back to the table that they really don't have right now because that's not Cheney he's not 220 pounds uh Parrish definitely isn't that guy we don't really want to be running him you know 20 times a game and then I think Chris Johnson's going to bring that ex what Ray Ray Joseph is brings to that receiver group I think Chris Johnson brings that to that running back room they don't have that right now and I, I, I'm a little worried about the depth right like I, I think the walk-on kids are are probably really tough um, and, you know, we're high school stars and things of that nature. But if we're relying on walk-ons as the, like at the three deep, which obviously we want with two running backs coming in, it's worrisome because last year we had Lucius Stanley come in a week before the season, it seemed. And yeah, he was a guy that was actually getting some burn. We don't want to see that again. You, you, you don't see Alabama. You're, Alabama's fourth guy is a blue chipper. Alabama's fifth guy is a blue chipper, right? Uh, Georgia, Alabama, Georgia's fifth guy is a blue chipper, right? So you got to get to that point where you are stacking running back talent and loading that room because there's just so much injuries to be had at that position. And, and I think that. But Miami, once they have Fletcher, Chris Johnson, Trevon, Cheney, Parrish, their fifth guy is still a blue chipper. Yes, absolutely. But. Citizen still injured. We don't. We saw him at the spring game. He's in a huge brace, not walking normal. There is. It is not an impending comeback for for Trevante Citizen, and I think people need to know that he is not ready to play. He doesn't look like he's even close to getting onto a football field. And all the rumors that we're hearing that he's not going to be back healthy until the fall are looking to be true. So I'm worried about that. All right, Parrish is is a slight of frame was already banged up last year. Hopefully that doesn't happen again because I think he's going to be a core piece of this offense. Don Chaney, extensive injury history dating back from high school. So that's something to worry about. Mark Fletcher has had injury history during his time in American Heritage. This was the first season in his high school career where he finished a season the full way, right? No missed games, no real bad injuries, no real bang-ups. Um, and then Chris Johnson. Chris Johnson ain't a, ain't exactly a guy who's had a full workload in high school either. His right. senior year was his most expansive workload as a running back. He has split carries and, and was never really the guy until his true, truly his senior year where he blew up. So yeah. there's a little worry there. There is a little worry course, there. Course, yeah. and, and they're going to have to utilize all four guys. It this year so that you don't run into those depth issues that Miami had last season. So that's something that just, uh, you know, you got to keep an eye out on because when I saw number 20 going out there and I saw, what was it? 30 going out there. I was like, Oh boy, what are we doing? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, why am we going starting a linebacker? Love, love the effort. Ryan we're going brings to the table, man. But if he's going out with our first group, I'm thinking Manny D I'm getting Manny Diaz flashbacks that I don't want. So, <laughs> <laughs> it's just it's something I just don't want to see. But yeah. outside of that, I, I think the defense looked pretty good. Um, I, I think that the corners showed up better than we expected. A little worried about the cornerback depth. And, you know, hearing rumors that, you know, with DVD no longer in that room, there could be some movement to be had. Um, so we'll expand on that in the message boards a little bit. But overall, um, they got to they gotta do a better job uh, with getting depth. At that cornerback spot, very similar to running back because you lose out on Antoine Jackson, you lose out on Cormani McLean, 
in the 2023 class. Those people want to act like, oh, we don't want divas in the program. You might not want divas, but you want depth. And, yeah. and when, when you don't have talented guys to, to back up your starters, it's going to be rough. It's going to be rough if, if there's any injuries, right? And, and we know Daryl Porter is, has just gotten to a suitable weight, right? Um, and Devontae Brown had injury issues last year at UCF. So, again, depth is definitely an issue, and I think that's one of the biggest focuses for Mario Cristobal right now is, is flipping the talent on the, in the, on the roster but also adding depth. And I think that in the transfer portal, you might see one or two cornerbacks be added to this roster uh, over the next week or two because that is a position of focus right now. Um, and overall, I think the defense look. I think the linebackers look solid. Right, we didn't get to see Corey Flag much because of uh, injury this spring. Um, you know, James Williams not out there. I think he's going to be a guy. And Lance Guidry has said this. Right, he's going to be a guy that's going to be playing closer to the line of scrimmage this year. Which thank God, and that means that we're going to see the emergence of Marquise Williams, who has looked really good this spring. Yeah, he's looked yeah. really good this spring, good and I think too. I think we're going to end up seeing a too high set of Cam Kinchins and Marquise Williams by the end of the year with James okay. Williams. Hot moving. take, right? Huh? Hot take. Hot take, right? But I think that's by the end of the season, your two safeties are going to be Marquise Williams and Cam Kinchins with James Williams playing more of that nickel role that we saw Ryan Raccoon at uh, this this uh, this spring game. And I know TC is going to be mixing in there too, but I think that they want to save James – you know, obviously he's had some injury issues as well, coming off the shoulder surgery. I had, had some injuries in high school as well. Uh, he's going to be a guy that's playing closer to the line of scrimmage, which is when we've seen him at his best. So um, I think I think this defense is going to be really good this year. I think Lance Geiger is doing some really good things. There's going to be a wave of defensive, defensive transfers, so just watch for that. Yeah, uh, you hit on what I was going to say as far as concerns, which is the depth. Bro, like the, the there's depth concerns on this team pretty much at every position group for me, except for defensive line. I think the linebacker, line, linebacker, they added five, linebacker, they added five. Yeah, I mean, uh, to be honest, yeah, I, I see K4, uh, Francis Mar Francisco Maragoa, Wesley, and I'm missing somebody who's in there a lot. Yeah, so when when and Marcel is. When 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 Marcelli is pulling, I mean Corey Flag, he'll be he'll be fine. Corey you Flag, know, Corey, Corey Flag is gonna be that guy, and then you rotate guys like Bobby. You rotate like Marcelli is pulling him, like you said, Millie Bryant. Hopefully he emerges. So and, but and Chase I, I, but Smith, I haven't seen and Chase Smith also was that was at the spring game not dressed. Um, so yeah, you potentially do have have some depth at linebacker. But you haven't really seen uh, all these guys yet. So I guess, you know, until I kind of see them out there on Green Tree, then then I'll feel good about the linebacker position as well. But but, but at DB, I certainly see depth issues there. Um, Robert Stafford, I would imagine, is probably not going to be ready to play, you know, you know, when he comes here in the fall. Demario Brown, I'm sure there's going to be a learning curve for him as well adapting to the game, but I think he will adapt well to it because I, you know, I think the world of, of Damari Brown and then the other guys behind him, like, you know, Jaden Harris or Chris Graves I worry about them being in big game situations during the season, if they have to be. So, so definitely there's some concerns there and there's concerns to me on this offensive line, as far as depth. I mean, Yes, Francis Melgoa. Um, I need to I need to get his name right. It's really Mal Malanoa, apparently. <laughs> um is great that he's he's able to, you know, showcase his talents, but nobody really wants to play a freshman on the offensive line. And when that happens, that means you have some depth concerns, <laughs> you know? I mean, we did violent. I mean, there was a Zion Nelson appearance. Um, he was on the field, uh, not, not in a brace. So that was, that was positive to see. So hopefully you get him back for the fall. It seems like 
we will based on the way he was walking around, the fact that he didn't have a brace on, you know, interacting with his teammates. Um, my guess is that he'll be ready for fall camp. But, um, you know, players like Matthew McCoy weren't out there. Jonathan Dennis. Uh, I mean, they were out there, but they were just not dressed. Tony uh, Tripp. Antonio Tripp, you know, had an injury as well. So there are some depth concerns when it comes to this offensive line. I mean, Javion Cohen and Inez Cooper practiced pregame and didn't play. Um, and it, it was injury concerns, got a little nicked up. Um, according to Cristobal, after the game, they just got a little nicked up and they didn't want to risk anything. So offensive line naturally is a position that usually gets injured a lot. So I'm still concerned about this offensive line going into, um, you know, the season. Um, you already addressed the running back position, how there's depth concerns there. A wide receiver I actually feel pretty good about. You know, I, I think though that was like one of the bright spots from this spring game for sure. Uh, the, the fact that, Kobe Young looked pretty decent out there. Isaiah Horton made some nice catches. Uh, X was X, as he always is. And then you saw Nathaniel Joseph, of course, with that explosive play and being utilized in different ways. Uh, Bashard Smith out there. And, um, of course, Jacoby George looked really good to me. He looked really good, just really crisp. Uh, with his routes, uh, made a really nice catch with the touchdown. That one screenplay that went for, you know, about 30, 40 yards or something like that, that got called back, looked great. He just looks like he is ready to show what he's always shown, you know, to us in, in high school at Plantation. So really excited for him as well. And there were some players that we didn't even see as far as receivers. Frank Ladson, we didn't see. Uh, Michael Redding, um, we didn't see. Not to say that we expect him to do big things in the season, but that's depth, you know, uh, just in case, you know, one of those top guys go down, you have guys who have experience, who have game experience that can kind of step in there. So wide receiver, I actually feel pretty good as far as the depth is concerned. But overall, this team is just still, it's it's just not deep enough. I think to sustain a long season where the injury bug bit Miami pretty hard last season. And one place was the quarterback position. And if Tyler Van Dyke goes down, I think we got a controversy for, for the back of quarterback. Um, I think that's really going to be a serious conversation going into fall. Uh, because one of the concerns or, or negatives that I saw was Jakari Brown. Jakari Brown, let's be honest, let's call it what it is. He didn't look good. He did not look good in, in the spring game. I mean, Cristobal kind of downplayed it after the game, saying that, you know, he didn't have a good game, but he's, he's been good all spring. But it's a concern that he didn't look good, but Emory Williams did. You know, and albeit uh, Emory Williams was playing against, you know, the threes and Jakari Brown play, playing against the twos. But still, uh, it, it just the optics, the optics did not look good with Jakari Brown. I don't know if he was nervous or not comfortable with the offense just yet. But I think that's going to be a real conversation going into spring of who this backup quarterback will be just based on what we saw from Ember Williams and what we didn't see from Jakari Brown. Yeah, I totally agree with you there. Now, one thing I want to say is that I think that they add at least one outside wide receiver from the transfer portal. We've seen them look at some junior college guys. We've seen them look at some transfer portal guys. We've seen them look at a D2 receiver that's an All-American. So uh, I think that they add at least one outside guy because you don't know what you're going to get from Frank Lads and you don't know what you're going to get from Michael Reddick especially with the injury issues that they're dealing with right now. There's not a lot of outside talent on this team. Slot, abundance of guys. You, you can you can throw you can throw a stone and you're hitting a slot receiver in this offense basically, yeah. but but outside talent, man, I like I love what I saw from Isaiah Horton. I think he looks really good. 
everything we heard from the spring translated to the game. Same thing with Jacoby George, right? Jacoby Young looked good once again. But outside of that, you you got to have more than three outside guys, right? Colby, we like we know we're gonna get. Jacoby has had injury issues, has had suspension issues. You don't know what you're gonna get. An unknown once again, right? It, once you get to a championship level team, there's not as many unknowns. There's a lot of unknowns for Miami right now, and that includes Jacoby George, Isaiah Horton missed all last season for injury. I know that they were probably playing it safe with him, but. He still missed the entire season last year and didn't have one appearance, I don't think. So I think they got to add at least one more guy at that at that outside receiver spot that can compete with Jacoby George and Isaiah Horton. Um, you know, maybe like a K.J. Osborne type addition. You know, maybe not like an elite power five guy, but a guy that can come up from a, from a lower, uh, you know, level of play and, and come make a difference at the University of Miami. I think that that's something that they're going to need. Obviously, they're going to use Jaleel Skinner a little bit as a receiver as well, so it, it helps, you know, soften that blow a little bit. But still, I think that outside receiver is definitely a need for this team. I agree with you that the depth is better than it was last year, and I think that the talent is probably better than it was last year. But overall, still need to add one more guy. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think one more thing on the spring game is just the abundance of guys that were out of this game. There was like almost an entire football team was was out uh, as far as not playing. Um, just so many guys just not dressed. So, I mean, that's kind of a it was a negative because he didn't kind of see them. But it was a positive as well, because, you know, a, a lot of big play guys will be contributors uh, to this team that were not out there, like Leonard Taylor. Um, Mesador was was very got me, very minimal playing time. He's absolutely going to be a contributor. Jafar oh, Hardy, yeah. yeah, not not on not on the field at all. Um, but you know, did dress was of course, of course there. We talked about Chase Smith, um, Jared Harrison Hunt, uh, Matthew McCoy, um, Zion Nelson, Bobby Washington. Who, Bobby Washington, there's just so many players, Collins Oshenpong, so many players that were didn't didn't play in this game. Javion Cohen ended up not playing in this game. So that that gives you some gives you some excitement going into going into the season. And then at the same time, though, that there's a lot of guys that I feel like will never see the field, you know, to be honest. You know, like that, that there's some players here that I'm um, just like, you know, I don't think you'll you'll ever see the field, um, to be honest, just based on depth, based on what we've seen in the spring, based on we the players that are injured, based on what we know that's coming in the fall. You know, I'm not going to name those guys, but, you know, like there's some guys that will never see the field and just anticipate some players possibly transferring out in the next you know, month or so, because there's just not going to be a moment for, for these players to, to, to really shine. And I think they'll have an opportunity to shine elsewhere. Uh, that's yeah. all I got as far as uh, the spring game. Well, what they would imagine Cyrus Moss appearance, Cyrus oh, yeah. Moss appearance. How about that? <laughs> that, that, How about that? that? Nobody's talked about Cyrus Moss. Jason Taylor mentions him. Says he basically compares Cyrus Moss to himself, to himself. right? That's who he's that's who's coaching him now. He gets a sack in the game, makes an appearance, and nobody's talking about him. We got to give Cyrus Moss some love. Cyrus Moss, all right. Listen, I'm all just right, glad Cyrus he's Moss out there because him. listen, it could have been a Jabari Ishmael type projection for him, and it has not been. Now we saw him; <laughs> he had his little moment, right? That gives me a little bit of hope that he can be a guy that can put potentially be a situational pass rusher for this team at some point. I like what I saw from Cyrus Mons. He looks a little bit bigger, like 215 now maybe. Maybe now he's big enough to play outside wide receivers. So I'm uh, I'm, I'm liking what I see from Cyrus Mons. I just had to mention that because yeah, I don't yeah. feel like anybody's talked about it yet. We got to give credit yeah, where credit yeah. is due. Cyrus Moss, good job, my guy. Good, good job, Cyrus Moss, for, for making the stat sheet, you know. Uh, <laughs> good job by him. Uh, one other concern that just kind of popped up in my head is, um, first off, uh, Branson Dean was not dressed as well. Another another guy that's not dressed. And 
Thomas Gore was kind of a no-show in this game. He played, but kind of a no-show. Ahmad, so, Moten. Ahmad Moten stood out way more than he did. Ahmad Moten definitely stood out more. So, so, so this is our Antonio Moultrie. This is our Antonio <laughs> yeah, Moultrie. Yeah. This is this, that, is this year's Antonio exactly, Moultrie. That's exactly what it seems like because he's an undersized guy. I mean, uh, like, I don't know. He he. I, I saw him in in, in pregame. Um, he won a couple reps. Couple. I actually liked what I got. I saw from uh, Jacob Lichtenstein too. I mean, the defensive line is deep, and and the fact that he's there, I feel like just adds to the depth. I just want to throw that out there. How many um, how many GAs do you think that Jacob Lichtenstein is older than on that team? Right now? <laughs> uh, at, at least three. <laughs> at least three. Um, and Cam McCormick is probably older than all of them. You know, um, but yeah, so we, we've got some veterans on this team. That's another player, by the way, who did not play in this game. Cam McCormick, um, surprise, surprise, injured. Um, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, like Thomas Gore, uh, it's just a concern, potential miss on a transfer, um, you know, just just based on what I've seen and based what I know didn't play. Because once Leonard Taylor and Jared Harrison Hunt gets into the fold here and Akeem Mesitor is fully healthy, he's going to get lost on this depth. And who, are, and who are we waiting on from that 2023 class that Mario Cristobal loves? Oh, and Joshua Horton. Joshua Horton is another guy who is, we haven't seen yet will add depth to this to this uh, defensive line. So Depth? Hey, <laughs> Horton is a monster. Horton yeah. is a absolute monster. He's a game wrecker. It, like this, that is a that is a guy who has who is very close to a Leonard Taylor type player. That's that's he's gonna make some noise very early. I think it, him, Ruben Bain. Uh, I think Ahmad Moten's gonna have a good year. He looked really good as a pass rusher. Uh, I, I think that defensive line is gonna be very very good. Yeah, you know, Akeem Mesidor not even out there, right? Like, we know what Akeem Mesidor can do. He's one of the top 10 best defensive ends in college football. Yeah. He was he was one of the better defensive players in college football last year. And, sure. and, and, and to get him to come back, like, he didn't even really have to come back. He could have gone to the NFL draft if he really wanted to, which yeah. is another credit to Mario Cristobal that he's keeping guys in the program that should be staying for another year to help build this program to what it needs to be and. And the depth concerns are something that Mario Cristobal has talked about since he's gotten here, right? It's it's a process in building this roster because he is take he took a roster that was like Butch Davis, like late 1990s type roster, like post post pro probation type roster type thing. Sure. Not, like you're seeing the Mario Cristobal evaluation start to shine through really quickly. We saw it with that 2022 class and Wesley Besaint. We thought we were going to see it from Trevante Citizen. There were some other guys that had their moments. Isaiah Horton's now another guy in that 2022 class is looking really good. You're getting Inez Cooper, who's who's a perennial starter on this team. Now this 2023 class, as soon as their spring game, early enrollees making an early, early impact. Mario Cristobal evaluations are the bedrock of this team right now, I would say, outside of like Tyler Van Dyke and Cam Kinchins and James Williams. Those are pre-Mario Cristobal additions. But really, there are so many good players that are coming from Mario Cristobal, Dennis Smith, all these guys that are that are doing talent acquisition, which is a part of college football now. And I think that that's why more time is needed for this staff. I think that they got the right offensive staff in place for what they want to do with this team. I think that they have the they added the necessary pieces on the defensive side of the ball. I think the DVD loss uh, to FIU is going to hurt them a little bit uh, because him and the die working together together at corners is better than just one head, right? So, but overall, I like what they have with Jason Taylor, Joe Salavea. I love Derek Nicholson. All the recruit, recruiting reports that we've heard from kids rave about that guy. And Lance Godry working with the safeties is only going to make Cam Kitchens and James Williams, Mark Keith Williams, Caleb Spencer better over the long run. Uh, so I, I think everything is in place, but it's still uh, at least a year away from double digit wins, in my opinion. Uh, just because, like we've been saying, you got to fill out the back end of this roster. The same way the Alabamas, the Georgias, the Ohio States do, where they recruit 
behind guys and then everybody comes on up. It's not reliance on the transfer portal. It's not a sustainable model. Like Florida State's doing it right now, but we're going to see how long that that works, right? We saw it with we saw it with uh, you know, Mark Rick, you know, bringing in guys. We saw it with, you know, uh, Manny Diaz really relying on the transfer portal. It, it's not something that is a sustainable model for success. And I love what Mario Cristobal is doing in recruiting it. And we're seeing it even more so in 2024, where they are trusting their evaluations. It is not; it does not matter to them if it's a three or a four star guy. Which, outside of quarterback, I think that the stars are important. I just want to say that right now. We've gotten a lot of backlash about you know pumping up three star quarterbacks like Judd Anderson, but quarterbacks are such an unspecific science. It's in you, there's no way to to really know if a quarterback is going to be good or not because so many things go into a quarterback being su- successful, right? Offensive yeah. line, guys catching the football, a sustainable running game. If, if he doesn't have those things, he's not going to be successful. You can put a three-star guy in a really good offense, like a Stetson Bennett type player, and he can do really well. Yeah. Other positions, right, they're reliant on themselves. We know a receiver is good even if he has a shitty quarterback. All right, we, we know an offensive lineman is good if he handles his own blocks, right? Or if he if he's able to be a leader amongst that group. We know a running back is good even if he doesn't have a great offensive line. He's making people sure. miss. He's making big plays happen. Every other position, right? You need elite talent. Uh, at quarterback, you can recruit traits. And I think that you're going to see this class be surrounded by a lot of blue chip kids at defensive back. A lot of bit blue chip guys on the offensive line, the defensive line, the defensive line in this 2024 class, I think is going to be absolutely stupid. I think that it's going to be a heavy dose of top 100 recruits. I think that they're not going crazy at linebacker just because they brought in five guys. You're going to see them, you know, probably bring in one or two defensive back. They're going to be recruiting heavy. I, I could see, you know, three corners, maybe two, three safeties. Right. I, and I think you're going to see some big time blue chip hitters amongst those groups as well. So I, I, I think trust the Mario Cristobal process. Let let Mario work. Let him cook and let's let let things go, because it, he's proving time and time again that his evaluations are the best guys on this team. Perfect segue into recruiting. Uh, you kind of you know took us there. Um, we had, you know, Judd Anderson, like you said, added to the class, uh, almost about two weeks ago. And now we had Chance Robinson, hometown kid from St. Thomas Aquinas, four-star receiver, uh, that we both like a lot. And also added Dylan Day, defensive back out of the Bayou, not out of Bayou, who was balling last night against the Bucks, we're talking about out of the bayou, the boot, Baton Rouge, um, another, uh, uh, the first of many Lance Gidry specials to come out of Louisiana. So your thoughts quickly about, you know, just, just these two commits um, that happened this weekend. Yeah, so Chance Robinson, elite pickup. I've gotten a little bit of flack on calling him an elite receiver. I think he is an elite receiver. We we saw him score 14 touchdowns this year for one of the nation's best teams in high school football, St. Thomas Aquinas. Uh, This is a team that doesn't traditionally throw the ball a lot. And on like 30 catches, he had 14 touchdowns. So for me, he is an an elite player. And then outside of just what he can do as a football player, the relationships he has with the rest of that Miami Gardens Purple Machine group in that 2024 class is instrumental in potentially forming what is the future of this 2024 class. So I, I think that this was a home run addition to the class. He's a kid who can potentially come in early if you lose a Colby Young or a Jacoby George to the NFL draft. He is six foot one, 200 pounds almost, it looks like. He is a rock solid outside receiver with really good hands, good ball skills. Uh, his ability to move in space for a bigger receiver is really good too. His understanding of of red zone route concepts and you know body control um, is is next level. So I think that he's one of those players that could be a early impact guy at the University of Miami. And the fact that 
Miami was able to get him to jump in so soon after Judd Anderson counteracts any popular opinion that grabbing a three-star quarterback is going to limit their ability to recruit receivers in this 2024 class because this just proves the opposite of that. And I think that everybody needs to trust the Judd Anderson evaluation of this staff. Everything we've heard was that he fits what they want, and we see yeah. – that they did the same thing with Emory Williams. I still think they're going to go after a big time second quarterback in this class, a kid who's a four or five star prospect. But this guy is their number one guy on their board, probably, and there's reason for it. And I think that they're able to convince kids like Chance Robinson that that is the case, that he's the best guy for the class. And home run, home run with that. And Dylan Day is is a very big unknown for us, right? There, there's not much. Uh, to be known, we know he got offered a little bit a little while ago. And when Lance Geiger got offered, he was part of that wave of Louisiana offers uh, that, you know, he was he was looking into. And uh, listen, he's going to fit a role in this defense. They're not just recruiting him aimlessly. He is a future nickel for this Miami Hurricanes defense. And he's got traits that once again, Lance Geiger loves. Right. He th- that. I think that nickel position is very similar to that quarterback position on offense where you can recruit traits and maybe not stars because you want a guy that can do certain things, maybe blitz off the edge, maybe be able to cover up somebody in the slot, maybe jump to the outside if needed, right? He, he's listed at six foot, 170 pounds, so he's got some decent size. Uh, I know people are going to complain about maybe the competition he's playing in Louisiana as a lower classification in that state, but Southern Lab has produced – Division one prospects in the past, they've produced kids. Southern Lab is, is, is a talent beacon in Louisiana. And I'm going to trust the guys that know that area much better than I do. I'm not from Louisiana, never claimed to, to know it other than like the, you know, Tyron Matthews and, and guys like that. Uh, you know, they were able to get Ed Reed out of Louisiana. So there's a pretty good track record there, right? So um, I think it's a good addition. Uh, you're going to need a lot of depth at this defensive, you know, at both defensive back spots, safety and corner. And if he's going to be a versatile guy that can fill both positions potentially, then good get. Yeah, I looked at his tape and I just thought first, like physical, this guy's physical and he is the physical corner that, you know, that you kind of hope like to, to Corey Couch would be, you know, at, like as far as just aggressive and when he 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 thuds you he he puts you he puts you on the ground like pretty soundly so that that was kind of the first thing for me when i was watching his tape and he seems to be really um aware of of kind of what to do in certain situations he knows when to kind of break on the ball keeps his eyes in in that backfield or on the quarterback or keeps his eyes on the quarterback's eyes and kind of where he's going with the football so i kind of like that um uh, reached out to some guys in louisiana to find to find out more about this kid because you know uh this kid was is is under the radar he's he's a quiet kid he's not very vocal about uh, social media kind of on what he's doing or whatnot his his visit kind of went under the radar uh he visited a couple of weeks ago to miami uh he loved it i did touch base with him he's uh sounds like a good kid sounds like he really feels like miami's going to develop him into a great player and a great man um but yeah i I reached out to some uh somebody in louisiana and and he said um from a text he said really good kid pretty long lean athlete runs track i did notice that ran almost a, a 21 second uh 200 meter which is pretty darn fast and uh he also said plays with good instincts anticipation and good ball skills smaller school program just like you said uh but one of the top smaller schools in the state and he won a title as a sophomore so so you've got the you know, it's a, it's a small, from my guess, it's like the small private school. It looks like they play their games at Southern University. Uh, it's like a Chaminade. So it's, it, so I'm not saying they're Chaminade, right? But I'm saying it's a comparable. As far as the size. Is size of the school, structure. right? Still producing like a shopping yacht or a Chaminade. Like traditionally, yeah. that's what we've seen in South Florida, right? As though two, those two schools that have 
five, you know, anywhere ranging from 200 to 500 kids in the school, but still are able to produce top level talent. That's what Southern Lab does. Um, so, yeah. listen, Dennis Smith, uh, the director of recruiting, and Lance Guidry are two Louisiana guys. They know this area well. They know enough. They have a, a number of contacts in that area to know what is going on. Lance Guidry just came from Tulane. I know he was at Marshall before that and didn't really spend much time at Tulane, but he knows the area. He knows yeah. what's going on. He knows that yeah. landscape. So, it's like in southeastern Louisiana. So, yeah. So, it, it, it's you got to trust the process and and listen that nickel position is such a niche spot right that's that's a guy that's a spot where it's really conformed to what the defense is asking and time and time again when you ask defense coordinators who's the most important player in your defense a lot of times they say that nickel back and that nickel spot which has to be the most versatile player on their team. You got to be able to play like a linebacker at times. You got to be able to play like a safety. You got to play like a corner. You got to blitz off the edge. You got to do so many different things. So if, if they felt like he had a versatile enough game to be able to jump into this position, which I don't think that they feel like they have the guy that fits that mold perfectly right now. We know James is getting closer to the line of scrimmage and that's going to be a fun thing to see. But we saw Corey Couch not out there the entire time. There was a reason Ryan Ragon was out there at that third linebacker nickel spot, right? It's because TC can't tackle. It's just what it is. Like it's still weird to me the the fact that Ryan Ragon was out there. It's just weird. But okay. even listen, I love Keontra Smith, right? Like he's a, he's a South Florida kid who was a really good high school football player at Chaminade. He's a, a another kid that on a championship level program, you're not seeing that guy on the field. It, it, it's just what it is. It's just what it is. And, and that's Love what DeAndre it, Smith in high school too, man. He was, he, he was, was a bad way. boy. He would, he would knock, he would knock your helmet off. Right. But again, right. Like he's, that's not what you're recruiting at championship level programs. And if you go look at nickel recruiting at those championship level programs, they recruit guys for traits. Like it's like, Literally, and listen, Earl Little was a you know high four star prospect, but Alabama recruited him with the idea of playing nickel, right? Like you recruit certain guys that might not be great on the outside, might not be a great safety, but they could be great at doing it all, right? So I, I think that I'm excited about Dylan Day. I know it's a three star and a three star kid, and I know not many people know about him. He's not that hot name, but. Time and time again, we see hot names being recruited at defensive back, and they come to college football, and nothing comes of it, right? Cornerback is another position where the evaluations are all over the place because it, it's hard to it's hard to compare high school receivers to the freaks of nature that are college receivers. So you got to recruit guys that their ceiling is a little bit higher, or you know they can project out to do certain things. And I think Dylan Day has the potential to do just that. There was another player out of Louisiana who wasn't highly rated, became a Hall of Famer, went to Miami. I don't know if you know him, but I don't know if Ed Reed rings a bell to you at all. But uh, that guy was a two-star coming out of Louisiana. Um, So if if that doesn't get you excited, then I don't know what does. Hey, but hey, Marcus, you're the hot take guy, so I'm gonna let you make the Ed Reed comparison to Dylan Day. It's not an Ed Reed comparison. Hey, hey, you said it. You said it. (laughs) There's other players who come out of the Louisiana area who are underrated who end up being great players. That's all I'm saying. No Ed Reed comparisons coming here. (laughs) I already made one, you know, very outlandish uh, take today. I'm gonna keep it at that. Um, and then I just want to comment on Chance Robinson as well. He just a really good route runner, really good hands, um, good size, and wants to be a Miami Hurricane. And wants to be Miami Hurricane. I don't know if it's on the level of Nathaniel Joseph. And Nathaniel Joseph is like I don't know, like he he probably literally bleeds orange and green. Um, but Robinson is kind of of that. You know, he's that type of player. And he's also a player who still got a chip on his shoulder, which is very similar to a Nathaniel Joseph and a Ruben Bain. Um, Those players are South Florida kids, love Miami. You know, family loves Miami, all of them. And they're just wanting to prove to the city, to their family, 
to, you know, analysts that they are better than their star rating. I, I, I just think Chance Robinson is, is just one of those guys who is just really looking to prove. He only really had his first full season last season, you know, but before then we didn't see a lot of him. We saw some of him in, you know, seven on seven settings. We saw the talent um, for SFE. Um, but I, I think now we're really going to see more. And, and to your point earlier about St. Thomas, uh, they're a running team. You know, they've always been more so a running team. And I, I think he hasn't had as many opportunities as, say, if he was playing for Cardinal Gibbons, you know, uh, like where he would get a bunch of targets and a bunch of opportunities and he have a bunch of more yards and more than 14 touchdowns that he scored last season. So really excited about him and his potential. And to your point again, it could potentially start a rate, a wave of Miami gardens Ravens to, to commit to the class, which includes, you know, just shy trader and, you know, the committed Jamer, Jer, 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 Jeremiah Smith and, um, and others, you know, like Davion Goss committed to North Carolina, CJ Bailey, committed to NC State, and Louie McCoy also committed to um, Florida State. But we still got other players. Ryan, like Mack. Ryan, Mack. Ryan Mack is another guy. Ryan Mack, who, who plays with him on at St. Thomas Aquinas, could potentially could, uh, um, you know, be a player to commit to Miami. Miami's still very much on him, and that's actually the son of Rod Mack, who's the coach of the actual team of the Miami Gardens Ravens. So I think he's the perfect player to start the wave. And if, you, if it's like last year and Daniel Joseph was one of the first receivers to really kind of start the wave last season. So, so I love the, I love the pickup there uh, for Miami. Um, so quickly, just, let's just talk about who do we expect next? And we're expecting a really big week of, of commits for Miami. So, uh, as far as as far as I'm concerned, every couple of days you, you're going to see a commitment. And, of course, make sure you visit canescounty.com for exclusive information on on commitments. Visit our message board, Canes Talk, for uh, exclusive information on that. But um, what? how do you see this week and month potentially playing out? There's going to be a massive wave. Uh, coming. So th this staff has an MO, right? Where start off slow. And, and the reason they're starting off slow is not because they're not getting kids, right? That's, that's one thing I want people to like, people think Mario is striking out and they did this. If we go back a year from now, people were doing the same thing. Oh, Mario, well, he, he was only able to recruit because it was Oregon and, and Nike money and things like that. Right. And then all of a sudden, boom, it was Emory Williams. Boom. It was like, right, right. It was, it was just, it was like, commit 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 and there was like three different waves in in the last in in the last cycle i think you're going to see the same thing in this class they're going to hit on guys that they were consistent with in recruiting and guys that they had deep evaluations on so guys like juan Manaya, offensive lineman out of new jersey is a guy to watch um you know caleb odom is another guy to watch who's a freak athlete got a chance to see him this weekend he is every bit of his six foot five listed frame you know him and kj duff are very similar players uh you know not really a tight end but not totally a receiver just massive targets more of an offensive weapon type player than just kind of putting him in a box of, of one position uh you know and, and he has really good ball skills moves really well for a six five guy um so those are a couple of guys that i'm watching i think that you're going to see uh, additions at defensive back. You're going to see additions at offensive line. You're going to see, you know, spots at receiver um, and potentially even more um, on the on this next wave of uh, of commits. So it's it's going to be an interesting thing to to watch. Um, I think that this class is going to really start to pick up, and I think you're going to start to see some some closer guys to that five star range starting to to make some noise to Miami. Um, you know, we got we got a guy who's a high four star, um, you know, prospect that we're going to be reporting on, um, you know, soon today. Uh, okay. You know, so, some information in the message board. So look out for that, um, sure. that, we, that we got uh, that we like to go to Miami 
um, sure. in this class. And I think that, listen, there's a lot of momentum. Some California love. Some California love. Yeah. And uh, yeah, man, you're on your Tupac. Bring a little game, pocket right? to this, man. A little, little Tupac. A little Tupac. <laughs> and, uh, put you a know? little nineties in you, huh? But yeah, um, yeah. I, listen, I, I think that this staff is doing everything right. And the thing that I really love what they're doing is they're going after guys that want to be Hurricanes. And it's great to go after four and five star prospects, but if you bring in those guys and they're not the right culture fit, and what is a program transition still, then Things are going to fail, right? It, we look at it from the scope of, of the type of uh, coaches that they brought in uh, last year on the offensive side of the ball. It was supposed to be an all-star staff, right? It was supposed to be guys that are award winners, guys that uh, you know are, are are the best at their position, some of the highest paid player, highest paid coaches um, at, in around the country. And still, it was a failure because it it wasn't the best fit. So uh, you know. The, the evaluations being done by Mario Cristobal and Dennis Smith, and Alex Maribel, and Lance Guidry and Shannon Dawson, uh, I think are going to fit what they want to do, which is, listen, it, this game is about longevity. And you see that with teams like Georgia. You see that with teams like Alabama. You see it with teams like Ohio State, where you're not necessarily recruiting for it right now. You're recruiting for what are we doing in the future, right? Like, relationships like the chance Rob like people are going to look at the chance Robinson like oh we got a four-star receiver oh man you got a St. Thomas top prospect right you got a kid who's connected to the Miami Gardens Ravens program that routinely puts out guys and that like has produced guys like Nigel e. Kelly right and, and it has re- produced guys like Jeremiah Smith and Josiah Trader so it, it, being able to get guys from those programs to create pipelines uh, I think are the most important thing and that's what this staff is doing they're hitting regional areas right like they're still going after that northeast area with New Jersey kids Connecticut kids which I absolutely love because there's a lot of talent in that area they're hitting west coast really hard we're like Dylan Williams who's one of the top five linebackers in the country wouldn't have considered Miami under Manny Diaz. Like people got to understand they're like, Oh, Miami's striking out linebacker. No, you're not. They grabbed four, four guys that are elite players. And then Marcellius Pulliam, who's a three-star who might be the best of the bunch. Right. So it's the fact that this staff is doing things the right way. They're recruiting hard. Uh, You know, even though you don't have a ton of recruits right now, I'd rather have a ton of recruits and ton of commits in December then April. And and that's something that these fans got to understand. It's it, it, it's not about the beginning of the cycle. It's all about the end. And this team yeah. is playing the long game, and I love what I'm seeing. I think the fact that you get Chance Robinson from St. Thomas Aquinas is is really important because I, I was trying to – while you were talking, I was trying to think about who was the last player from St. Thomas Aquinas that committed – Mike Harley. To Miami. That's right, Mike Harley. Okay. Mike Carly, that's right. Um, and that was a minute ago. <laughs> that was a right, minute ago. Right. And I guess you could kind of say, I guess Xavier Restrepo spent most of his career at St. Thomas Aquinas, um, although he graduated from Deerfield. So I think that kind of counts. Well, he like, was only there one year. So he was at Monarch freshman and sophomore year, transferred to St. Thomas. Right. He was on Monarch. Transferred to Deerfield. He was on Monarch. I forgot about that. It felt like he was at St. Thomas longer. But, but yeah, so – so, yeah, I mean, the fact that you got got a guy from St. Thomas since Mike Carley, Mike Carley seems like ages ago, um, is, is, is a very good thing. Because, obviously, Miami's got a pipeline in, in, I would say, you know, three or four, you could say, major schools in the state of Florida. Uh, being IMG, Central, Chaminade, I consider one as well. And... Um, now St. Thomas. And you can um, even add Orlando Jones to that. They're starting and to build American a pipeline. Heritage. American Heritage is another American one. Heritage too. Orlando Jones in that Orlando area. Hey, listen, you grab Malik Bryant, right? You grab a DeAndre Robinson, who's another four-star defensive tackle in this 2024 class, right? You got Terion Coleman, who's a 2026 quarterback, who they're already on early. It has potential. It's potential. It has potential. We'll see. And, and I, listen, I don't think DeAndre guy, Robinson ends up with Miami, yeah, but – but um, but they're pushing, but they're pushing. You know what I'm saying? And 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 he's kept them among the top schools, and there's reason for that. Miami is building relationships throughout the state. 
They're building relationships with top programs around the country. We see Lance Geidry getting into Louisiana now. Mario with his relationships on the West Coast from his time at Oregon. Right. We have South Florida coaches here. Stephen Fields moves into more of a recruiting role and his relationships at Miami Northwestern, Miami Central, all those spots. You got Roland Smith in the program. Right. I love what the staff is doing. They're checking boxes. They're checking boxes. They're not. I feel like in the past, Miami, since since the early 2000s. Right. We've more been chasing than we are being strategic. Right. And and when we would get when Miami would get guys like Stacy Coley and, 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 and guys like that, it was more like we got him. We got him. We're good. We're good. We're, we're good for right now. Right. It was a it was a momentary success, not a long term play. And, and I think that that's that the staff is just doing the right things, like I said. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. All right. Before we kind of wrap up things here, uh, you were at OT7 Orlando 707 tournament. Um just kind of tell me a little bit about what you saw out there. DEFCON obviously came away with the championship. Uh, DEFCON just looking really good out there. They they nearly came home with the uh, with the Battle Houston uh, championship as well. They've been pretty solid pretty much all year. Actually, before we even go into that, I wanted to ask this before you go into that, which is – with the departure of DVD now, Demarcus Van Dyke, I know he was really connected with Zaquan Patterson, the four, two, five star defensive back from Chaminade. How does that affect the, the recruitment of Zaquan Patterson now? And do you feel do you still feel like he ends up picking Miami? I'm still sticking with Miami right now. I do think that it doesn't help uh, just because he's had such a strong relationship with Zaquan since he was a kid, uh, you know, coach him in little league football. Uh, he's more like a big brother to Zaquan, you know, a, a, an, an adult male figure in his life rather than just the coach recruiting him. He's talked about that time and time again, but Zaquan's also been adamant that he is not going to a school for a coach. He's not going to, he's not pledging to a school for, for one guy because he knows that at any moment that guy can leave. All right. And, and uh, you know, I, I think, he wasn't phased by it that much. I think he was a little surprised about the FIU, uh, you know, take. Um, but overall, I think overall, like, he's still going to consider Miami. Miami's got to keep pushing. There's a good relationship there, uh, you know, with, with the rest of the staff. A lot of those guys know Saquon Patterson. He's been on campus multiple times. He was recently on campus just a couple weeks ago. Um, I think it, it, Florida State is no longer uh, going to be a factor in that recruitment, I believe. Uh, it's going to be a race between Miami, Michigan, and Ohio State. Um, Georgia's and not in it anymore. I don't think George George has got two. I think two or three safety commits right now. So I don't necessarily see that happening. Um, you know, I, I, but I, I think if you're looking at like the top three schools, in my opinion, it's going to be Michigan, Ohio State, and Miami. Let's see if like Ohio State hasn't been in the picture as long as Michigan and Miami. So let's see what happens right. there. You know, I, we, we've seen them jump into the race later right. in the game. Like and, Aaron and they Nolan. Just snatch up people, right? Like Aaron snatch Nolan, people. like you said. <laughs> yeah, so it, that could be something that happens. Obviously, it, Zaquan's the type of kid that can pretty much play anywhere in the country very early. This weekend, he decided that he was just going to play receiver, and he was arguably the top receiver in the entire tournament. He would okay. dominate. He dominated, and and there was a lot of a lot of really good talent out there. But he, him, and him and Mike Alhado, who's a Hawaii commit, Bishop Gorman quarterback, just had a really good connection all weekend. And Zaquan's one of those kids that I feel like is a must get. Right? He, he's he's a Cam Kinchins. He's he's a James Williams. He's he's a Wesley Besaint. He's a must get type guy that can who's an ultra competitor, generational competitive nature, and just a freak athlete that you can plug and play at multiple anywhere. different positions, anywhere. pretty much anywhere. We've seen him play corner. We've seen him play safety. We've seen him get closer to the box. He's just an, he's just a football player. And uh, Miami's still deep in the race, though. I'm going to keep my forecast on Zaquan Patterson at University of Miami right now. But the Big Ten is something to watch there. Okay. Uh, just other standouts from OT7. Boo Carter. Boo Carter is a bad boy. And and I know he dropped the top five in December that didn't include Miami. But before that, he had Miami in his top 12. And getting a chance to speak to him 
he did talk really well about the University of Miami, but not playing safety or receiver. He was talking about playing running back. Um, so there's been conversations with him at running back at the University of Miami. He has spoke to Coach Tim Harris, and we got an article coming out on that soon. So, um, you know, watch out for that. Um, and then, you know, Zaquan, who I talked about, stood out really well. Jamie French, who's a North Florida kid, is really, really good for South Florida Express. I think he had like four touch, four or five touchdowns of pool play. He's a, a legit 6'1", 6'2", filled out frame. Like from a year ago, he was a skinny kid. Now he is absolutely filled out. Lower body looks like a college receiver. Uh, 2025 kid uh, who's a high four-star player. Uh, Malachi Tony looked really good. Josiah Trader, elite at all times. They even put him on defense a little bit. He was strapping up on that end. Um, Quarterback-wise, C.J. Carr, a Notre Dame commit quarterback who has actually been in communication with Miami a little bit, not saying that there's a flip coming or anything along those lines. C.J. Carr play for? He plays for California Power. Um, So he's a a West Coast quarterback, a California kid. um, And, and, you know, California Power has kind of burst onto the scene as one of those elite seven-on-seven programs this year, and he's been a huge part of that. Um, He was throwing a Kylan Fox who this was my first time seeing him in person. He is a massive target who has still some room to put some mass on, but he moved really well, caught the ball, contested catch opportunities. He he like was catching everything under underneath and still making some plays. So ultra athletic tight end. And, and you know, Miami is deep in the race for him. I, I have a forecast. I don't know if we have a forecast in for him yet. And if we don't, he, it's probably going to be coming soon. He's yeah. a kid that's looking at UCF. Um, I think tech, no, not Texas. Uh, it's mostly UCF and Miami. And I think a few other schools, um, another kid who wasn't out there, but got a little bit of Intel on Elijah Lofton, Bishop Gorman quarterback, I mean, uh, tight end, who is one of the best tight ends in the country. Watch out for him, uh, you know, to, to drop, you know, another top schools thing. Um, I think it's going to be Texas and Miami, um, that are going to, you know, be those final two schools for him. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see what happens there. Uh, you got Brevin Jordan in his ear, fellow number nine from Bishop Borman, uh, yeah. talking to him about what University of Miami brings to the table. So that's going to be an interesting recruitment. Um, and then, you know, Micah Alhado, I, I got to give my guy some props. The five foot eight lefty Hawaiian quarterback from Bishop Borman, who's just committed to Hawaii. That kid is the best quarterback in seven on seven. He is in He's elite. To Hawaii. Yeah, I missed that. You know who is quarter, and you know who the coach is in Hawaii? Tommy Chang. I don't know if you guys remember yes. Tommy Chang. Yes, I Tommy Chang, record breaking Hawaii quarterback, right? Yeah. Last also, time Asian- Hawaii went undefeated was under Tommy Chang. Yeah. So uh, Timmy Tommy Chang. Chang. Timmy Chang. Timmy, yeah. Uh, Timmy Chang. He he uh he was a record breaking quarterback at Hawaii was an elite player in college. Uh, and you know, he sees a lot of the same things with Mike Alhado. And, you know, I even got a chance to speak to Alonzo Highsmith one time about uh, Micah who he loves as one of the best quarterbacks in the country. I think if this kid wasn't five foot eight, if he was five eleven or even five ten and a half, like a Bryce young, this kid would have every offer in the country. He is such an elite quarterback, just makes things happen, throws guys open, um, and then two guys that I got to talk about, and I know it's a little bit of DEF CON talk, but they did win the tournament. Kamari Williams. Um, well, been talking about DEF CON this whole time. What do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> Kamari, Kamari Williams is a stud. Kamari Williams is a four star kid in the 2025 class who's six foot three, six foot four. He made the most incredible grab of the seven on seven season with sunglasses on, and he absolutely snatched it out of a defensive back's hands. In the back of the end zone, you can go on OT7 Instagram and check that out. It's It was an elite play. But um, a couple other guys that I really liked, um, you know, were Bryce Underwood physically is everything you want in a quarterback. I think that he's got some room to grow as, as a passer, but you saw some flashes of what he can really do. And I, and I think he's going to be a guy that is going to continue to just get all the accolades. Unfortunately, Miami's not in the race for him right now, but he's just a guy that's like physic, the most physically imposing quarterback I've seen in a long time, and that's saying a lot. Um, Jalen Hayward, Georgia commit, who yeah. safety, who Miami is still on. Yeah, he visited he Miami is, recently. He is so explosive and fast, makes things happen. He doesn't even mean to hit guys in seven-on-seven, seven, but he's just moving so 
so fast that he just runs through people. Uh, you know, he has 10, six times in a hundred meter. So just a, a truly special athlete. And, and I, I love the kid's energy, just constantly talking crap. Uh, he is getting in your face. He is, he is an emotional kid in all the right ways. And, and I think he, he's a guy that Miami's got to continue to push for. Um, I don't know if there's a flip coming at all from Georgia. I think they pretty much got him locked in right now. But the fact that Miami was able to get him on campus was a positive development. Sure. Good stuff. Good stuff from Orlando. Uh, that's going to be it for the – well, actually, no. Let's talk a little – just a little bit of baseball just because we're going into – Basically, baseball and recruiting and camp season and spring high school football season right now. That's basically what to look forward to uh, in, you know, just in, in sports in general and from canescounty.com. That's what you will see. And the Miami Hurricanes baseball team, I didn't see if the rankings came out uh, again, but they I'm pretty sure they're going to be back in the rankings again after winning the series against the 13th ranked uh, North Carolina team. Uh, this team has got some pop, right? It's got some power. They they can hit home runs with anybody. They lead the ACC in home runs, and I I, I think they that that alone I think will be enough for them to host the regional. I think they have still have a very good chance of winning the coastal uh, division. Uh, but there's some other really good teams that Miami will probably not be able to overcome when it comes to the conference, like what we saw against them in against uh, Wake Forest, got swept, Virginia. Dude, they, that team is ridiculous. That Wake yeah. Forest team is ridiculous. They have, yeah. elite play, they have elite players at every position. The pitching is gross. What what? Yeah. How did that? How did the NCAA let that team get put together? I, <laughs> yeah, I, was, I don't know. I have no idea. I, I mean, it's a lot of transfers. Yeah, yeah, they got it. They got a ton of transfers, a ton of future MLB guys. Wake Forest is just. A, I mean, the the conference itself is just loaded. When you got when you got teams like Boston College, Boston College, like in the top twenty five, only got nine losses, like. That that's a team nobody expects to be good in college baseball or any sport for that matter. Uh, so when you got a team like that that in the conference and you're you know teams like you know North Carolina and 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 Virginia and Virginia Tech starting to come on now. Um, you know we already talked about Wake Forest and Louisville's you know, good. Louisville's a good team. I mean, it, it, it's just a loaded conference. And my, with that, I think Miami's going to be built for the postseason as long as they don't get one of these, you know, high-powered teams that are in the top, you know, eight. You know, I think there's a significant drop-off, like, with the top eight teams and everyone else. I think everyone else is – Miami's in that everyone else group. And if this team really wants to go far and make it to Omaha, though, this pitching's got to get better, man. This pitching is not – it's not Omaha level. It's NCAA tournament level, but it's not Omaha level. And now I'm concerned with Carson Lagone because he hasn't started in the past couple of weekends. So now I need to – at first I thought it was just a rest issue, but now he hasn't played again. I'm concerned that he is, is hurt in some way. More on that this week. I'm definitely going to inquire – about Carson Lagone and see what's going on there because he's their ace. You know, it, it, it's not Gage Zeal. It's not definitely not anybody else after that. Um, it, it's Carson Lagone. So they they if they want any chance of, of making it to Omaha, he has to be healthy and has to be playing well uh, in May uh, and in the ACC tournament. So, well, we'll we'll see what happens there, but you know, uh, as far as hitting is concerned, the this team can hit with anybody, man. Um, and then you got you got players that are kind of coming out of nowhere too, like Lorenzo Carrier <laughs> hit 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 a home run. Um, and you got players who who don't start, who don't typically start every day that come in and hit home runs, like like Ian Barrow, um, Carlos Perez. You know, I believe is still leading the team in home runs. And Blake Sear, I can't say enough about the freshman. He's going to be a star. I mean, the fact that he's leading the team in RBIs, 
and consistently, you know, is coming up with clutch hits. I mean, he had the 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 game tying solo home run in game one of the North Carolina game. The kid is just legit. And you already know what you're going to get from Yo-Yo Morales. Clearly going to be a first round MLB draft pick. Um, but the these these pitchers and the bullpen especially really has to step up. Aside of Andrew Walters, who's arguably the best closer in the game, his stats are just absolutely ridic- ridiculous. And, and a lot of the times, Gino Damari puts him in there in the eighth inning. So it's not like it's just one inning and, it, and it's lights out. It, it's two innings and it's and it's lights out. So it, it's great to know that you have that. But these these guys in the bullpen have to step up. I mean, outside of uh, Chris Senta and Alejandro Torres, you know, th- these other guys have potential to give up like four or five runs in an inning. So uh, at times, that, yeah. that's what you've seen at at, at times from this team, and it, and it's scary. Uh, and and the starters can't seem to hold up against the big name teams. You know, the Gage Gage Zeal and and um, Alejandro Rosario, they've been rocked a couple of times uh, this season, especially against the good teams. So this team's exciting to watch, though. You know, that that's the thing about it. They're, they're exciting to watch because of the home run power that they have. And then the pitching is going to let the other team <laughs> likely in the game. So it's going to be exciting towards the end of it. But um, they need Carson Lagone to, to come back and, and be healthy. And this bullpen has to get better if they have any chance at all. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Hey, listen, I, I I'm excited to watch some baseball this week, though. We're, we're we're making a little bit of segue away from some football. We still got recruiting going on, a lot of recruiting news, but I'm excited to be personally tapping into a lot of baseball uh, this week, um, and uh, and we'll be covering that heavy. Uh, you know, yeah. hey, we're the, we're number one in the game in covering baseball. You guys got to give us credit there, <laughs> baby, because nobody else yeah. is covering baseball. But listen. And, and it's a, yeah. honestly, I didn't know so much about Miami baseball until this season. And like CJ Kafis is a guy that I love, the Patelli love kid, CJ love Kavis. him. All right. Obviously, yo yo, fun to watch. Blake Sear, you know, special type guy. Um, but I, I'm, I'm excited because listen, if this team can just keep hitting the way that they do, and even when they go up against the top teams, if they can just hold them to four or five runs, this, this offense has the, the potential to be really good, and, and I'm excited this week to tap in a little bit e- even more so to that to the baseball side of this uh, this uh, job. Absolutely, uh, Bethune tomorrow night, and then Georgia Tech in a three game series this weekend. But that's going to wrap it up for the Storm Tracker podcast. Once again, this is Marcus Benjamin and Frank Tucker. Uh, we give you tons of information on the website canescounty.com subscribe for free you see that scrolling at the bottom use the promo code miami30 um also follow us on all basically social media platforms instagram twitter youtube or subscribe to this youtube channel lots of great videos interviews from seven on sevens press conferences highlights from practices and of course this podcast But uh, that's going to wrap it up once again, and we'll catch you on the next episode.